friend who's a researcher said that, you know, when you do a research experiment, you know, in a hospital or a medical institution, you have to put it to the ethical review board first to get approval. And one of the criteria is that you have to be asking a question that nobody knows the answer to. He said if we put the packet before an ethical review board, it would fail because we already know the answer. This reform has already failed at the state level and it's going to fail at the national level. What is the impact of the legislation on the uninsured in this country? Well, the initial estimates in 2009 by the Congressional Budget Office were that it would leave 23 million people still uninsured when it's fully implemented in 2019. Since that date, information came out, there have been higher estimates. Um, and, and if we look at state data in states that passed reform, and they always would say, well, we're going to cover this many of the population. None of them have ever achieved that goal. So we, don't, we expect it's going to be more than 23 million. Um, new report is saying that even in 2014, when the exchanges kick in, they may, there will probably be 30 to 40 million people with no insurance. So we're still leaving tens of millions of people out. Um, they're also cutting the funding our, our, to our safety net hospitals. This is very concerning. This was tried in Massachusetts. The rationale was that when everybody's covered, you won't need all these safety net hospitals. And uh, they found that opposite in Massachusetts, and now some of those hospitals are suing the state. Um, the one bright shining star in this legislation, from my viewpoint, is the, is the increased funding for community health centers. Because in this time, of our, our community health centers are really needed. They're, they're overflowing with patients. They're having to turn people away. It's, it's 
causing our primary care doctors, especially the lead practice, this is very serious, and it's growing the number of uninsured and underinsured. because all they do is ca cause more administrative burden and they cause people to delay or avoid necessary care. Um, we need to um, cover all medically necessary care. The, there's no reason why an entity should profit off of necessary care. If you want to profit off of other elective things, I don't have a problem with that. But if, if someone needs their care, they need to get their care. Um, simplified administration. We know that single payer we can, we can streamline at one set of rules for patients, for healthcare professionals, it costs much less. Um, choice of physician and treatment in the system everybody's in, you choose where you get to go, you and your doctor or other health professional decide what treatment you get, not an insurance administrator. Um, focus on preventive and timely care. Timely as we, as we remove financial barriers, people can actually go get the care they need when they need it and have better outcomes and hopefully cost less. And then finally, we demand accountability and transparency in our healthcare system so that we know where our healthcare dollars are going. 
So this is the pool, that NHP fund, that's the pool. And what we do is we take our healthcare dollars, our federal, state, local, some employer contributions, some other taxes, all that goes into the pool. And then out of the pool, that goes to pay for the health care. For the infrastructure, 80% of our health care costs are, are staffing, equipment, buildings, goes to pay for that, goes to pay for the individual care, including long-term care. How, do we, how can we afford this? We know that single payer has proven cost controls and we have numerous studies, and this is based on a study that was done in California for the state, just showing that the increased cost of covering people who aren't getting care and of removing the, the copays and deductibles is more than offset by the inherent cost controls in single payer of global budgeting for hospitals so they get, a, they get the money they need to care for their population. So no more, no longer are small community hospitals gonna go out of business. They have the money that they need to take care of their population. Of creating um, in this country the ability to actually negotiate for fair prices for services, pharmaceuticals, and devices. Um, there's a great article by Uwe Reinhardt called It's the Price is Stupid, because in the United States we have no negotiating ability to negotiate for these prices, and that's why we pay the most. Um, so we can actually create savings through a, a national health program. All right, we have what it takes. We've got great hospitals, well-trained professionals. We've got um, great research. We are spending enough money. So I'm gonna go a little bit into what's going on now with the movement. Uh, let's see. There we go. So Paul said 17 states. I have 20 states that are in some phase of single-payer legislation. And I know that um, North Carolina, I'm heading down there in a couple weeks. They're going to introduce legislation. And do I have New Jersey? New Jersey also. I was out there not too long ago. They're looking at it. So more than 20 states that are looking at state single-payer bills. Um, one state that we're very excited about right now is Vermont. Have you guys been hearing about Vermont? Yeah. Keeping up with that? Yeah. So um, we haven't seen the legislation yet. We have seen the proposal that they, that they put together. Um, the proposal needs some improvement to, to give it some of the cross controls that we want to see from a single payer bill, but they're continuing to push in Vermont and we need to continue to let them know that, that we're hoping that they can lead the way and pass single payer for our nation. What do we need to do? Education, education, education. As Paul said, it's not enough for us to know about this. We've got to take it out of here. So here's a very simple rule. If every single one of you can talk to one person a day, one new person a day about single-payer health care, we can really spread this. If you have a group that you belong to, bring single-payer to your group. Bring it to your family, your workplace. Everybody needs to know about this. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Um, Building coalitions, that's why it's so great to see that this was a PNHP, Jobs with Justice, and all the other event groups that came together, because it's, it's really going to be, a, this has got to be solidarity of the groups. This is about social and economic justice. Any group that's concerned about social and economic justice, we should all be working together to make this happen. Some interesting projects that are going on around the country, putting some pressure on, on health insurance companies. If there's some divestment campaigns, there's a shareholder resolution campaign going on against WellPoint to force them to look at becoming nonprofit. Um, these are some creative ways. I think the divestment campaign could really be an exciting way for college campuses to get involved. I was in college in the 80s with the apartheid, anti-apartheid movement, and I know that really got us involved. Um, so that's kind of a neat idea. And then. You know, it's striking to me how many people don't even understand what health justice is or when they're being 
uh, when they're being treated you know, with health injustice. They don't realize that premiums going up out of control, that being denied care, that um, you know, having being kicked out of the emergency room, you know, without the proper care that you need. These are all health injustices. Doctors being fired because they're spending too much time with their patients. Nurses being forced to take care of too many patients. Um, these are all health injustices that are occurring. Community clinics that are closing down. Community hospitals that are closing down. So. These are opportunities for us to expose what's going on in this country, to show that this is wrong, that this doesn't happen in other places. Other industrialized nations do not have this situation. We're abnormal. And so these are all opportunities to build solidarity in your community, to fight for health justice, and to make the point that single payer would, would change that situation. So I think I'm almost done. Yep, here we go. So why aren't we trying to be the best? Why don't we try to go for a national improved Medicare for all? It's the patriotic thing to do, right? So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you throughout the day.